Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Childhood Lead Poisoning. My name is Rachel Logan, the Training Technical Assistance Manager at North American Management. I would just like to introduce our speaker as well as go through the learning objectives and present some data on lead poisoning. We're happy to have Nancy Van Boris with us today, and through her presentation, participants will be able to list sources of lead exposure explain health effects of lead poisoning, as well as identify signs and symptoms of lead exposure. Nancy received her BS degree from West Virginia University and her MPH degree from Virginia Commonwealth University. She has extensive knowledge and experience with childhood lead poisoning, as well as her work through the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Center for Environmental Health during the early 1980s, where she analyzed blood lead samples for the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey in Haines. These studies resulted in leaded gasoline being removed from the marketplace. Her work also includes clinical and public health settings. She analyzed Virginia childhood lead testing data for her master's practicum, and she later became the state health department epidemiologist for childhood lead poisoning prevention programs. She currently is the program director for Lead Safe Virginia, and she received her certification as a healthy home specialist in 2010 from the National Environmental Health Association and the National Center for Healthy Housing. In a national survey conducted by the Centers for Disease Control, the survey found that lead exposure disproportionately affected children who lived in housing built before 1946, as well as children from low-income families and minority children of African American and Hispanic origin. In 2011, the Uniform Data System reported PHBC Health Center programs tested over 4,000 children for lead. Overall in the U.S., this table shows us that the number of persons tested for blood lead has decreased as well as the percent confirmed. Although this is the case, it is important for health professionals and healthcare providers to realize the signs and symptoms of lead poisoning and to prevent and reduce the number of those affected from lead. I will now turn the presentation over to Nancy. I'm going to um, share some information on childhood lead poisoning with you today. And these are the areas that I want to cover. We've got lead in its history, statistics, source of lead exposure, medical diagnoses, effects from lead exposure, and follow-up. The physical properties. Uh, lead is a silvery, gray, soft, and malleable metal. Its atomic number is 82. It has a low melting point. It's insoluble in water. And when in compounds, its valence states are usually 0.2 and 0.4. I mean, plus 2 and plus 4. Inorganic lead compounds are used as pigments. Organic lead compounds also exist as tetramethyl and tetraethyl utilize as gasoline additives. Being insoluble in water, it's soluble in solvents. Lead complexes with ligands contain sulfur, oxygen and nitrogen as electron donors. Another important fact about lead is that it is not biodegradable. Once in the environment, it pretty much stays there. We still have lead along our highways from all the years of using lead as gasoline. The lead from paint chips will fall on the ground around an old house, especially the drip line, will always be there unless physically removed. Lead contamination remains in many industrial sites. Some lead compounds are lead arsenate. Um, it's an insecticide. They've been used for in agricultural um, processes for centuries. Fruit growers used it for control of moths that attacked apple trees. It can often be found in water aquifers that are beneath, beneath these apple orchards. It's also been used for the control of gypsy moths on other types of trees and in gardens. And it's often found in canned foods that weren't properly washed. Lead acetate is called sugar of lead. 
because of the sweet taste and was used as an artificial sweetener for Roman wine. It's used today in some hair coloring dyes and imported makeup. Lead azide, which is used in cartridge primers primer, and primer cords for explosives. The lead in these primers is released as a small soot during firing of the gun. Many indoor firing ranges have high levels of lead. Lead-free primers became available in the 1990s and are gradually becoming popular. Lead chromate uh, paint pigments. Uh, this technique and materials used by Van Gogh probably resulted in repeated exposures to paint with a high lead content, such as lead as white lead, which is lead carbonate, and yellow chrome, lead chromium. The lead in these paints could have possibly exposed him and other painters through the digestive system in minimal daily amounts, giving rise to a clinical condition of chronic lead poisoning. This type of poisoning coincides with the clinical symptoms Van Gogh describes in his autograph letters, he had initial debilitation, a stomach ache with loss of his teeth, recurring abdominal pain, anemia, neuropathy, including epileptic crises. Lead oxide is a paint pigment called red lead, and it's used as a primer for rust protection on metal, especially bridges and hulls of ships. Uh, lead oxide in wrapper containing candy from Mexico. Uh, the ink um, was used to print the wrappers, often contained dangerous amounts of lead. Studies also found high levels of lead in the candy, especially those containing tamarind and or chili powder. Lead compounds of lead silicate, which is used for glazes for china, porcelain, and towels. Uh, the Roman techniques of glazing were most likely discovered sometime in the first century BC. However, it's important to note that lead glazing holds a long history in the ancient world, which spans far beyond before uh, Roman times. After the Roman period, the tradition spread, and eventually the process became a practice for mass-produced ceramics. Lead is used in some ceramic glazes today because it produces certain colors and helps prevent cracking. The FDA has established leaching limits on commercially made or imported products, but handmade items are not regulated. Ceramics purchased in foreign countries and those marked not intended for food may leach high lead levels. Galena is a natural mineral form of lead. It's the most important lead ore mineral. And we'll discuss that later as it's used sometimes in cosmetics. Tetraethyl lead, which is an anti-mock additive gasoline, uh, was first fabricated for use in gasoline in 1923 to achieve higher octane ratings. Lead in gasoline was gradually phased out. Before this occurred, 90% of airborne lead was contributed to this source. Lead and gasoline was not totally phased out until 1996, and today some farm equipment and race cars still use it. A little bit of uh, history uh, timeline uh, indicates that lead has been used for centuries, and although identified as causing health problems, it was never eliminated from production, as you can see here on this graph. The, lead, the last lead smeltering plant in the United States just closed December 31st of 2013. Even this has been criticized due to the need uh, to make ammunition. This town in Illinois has been operating this plant since 1892, and EPA is now coordinating the environmental cleanup. Now this famous letter uh, was written by Ben Franklin to let you know that we knew that lead had health effects even in 1786 in the United States, it was known to be hazardous, but we could still continue to use it. And here's an example of painter's palsy called dangles. This was associated uh, with lead poison because of the effect on the radial nerve. More history. 
an 1800s lead acetate, which we mentioned before, sugar of lead was used medicinally to control diarrhea and bleeding. In 1897, childhood onism recognized in Brisbane, Australia, due to lead paint, and it was banned there in 1914. 1917, childhood onism was recognized in the United States. In 1943, an extensive article was, was published on the effects of lead on mental development. In the 1960s, CDC defined lead poisoning with levels greater than 60 micrograms per deciliter. <clears throat> here's, a, here's a chart I put together with Virginia data showing um, the number of confirmed elevated blood blood levels greater than 10 by age category in 2011. As you can see, children under the age of 3 are at risk due to due to their frequent hand-to-mouth activity in the developing neurologic system. Um, the peak exposure, as you can see, is between 12 and 24 months of age. So this is when children use their hand-to-mouth behavior to investigate their surroundings. Examples include looking out windows, which picks up lead dust, playing with toys on the floor, and then putting these items in their mouth when they're teething. This is another statistical chart. Um, the medium concentration of lead in the blood of children between the ages of 1 and 5 dropped from 15 micrograms per deciliter in the period 1976 to 1980 to 1 1.2 micrograms per deciliter in 2009 to 2010. This is a de decrease of 92%. The concentration of lead in blood at the 95th percentile in children ages 1 to 5 dropped from 29 micrograms per deciliter in the period 1976-1980 to 3.4 micrograms per deciliter in 2009 to 2010. This is a decrease of 88 percent. The largest declines in blood lead levels occurred from the 1970s to the 1990s following the elimination of lead and gasoline. The data show continuing declines in blood lead levels from 1999 uh, to 2000 through 2010 when the primary focus of lead reduction efforts has been on the lead-based paint in homes. These decreasing trends were all statistically significant, including the trend in both the median and the 95th percentile over the most recent 12 years. The median blood blood level in black non-Hispanic children was statistically significantly higher than the median level for each of the remaining race ethnicity groups regardless of income level. The median blood blood level for children living in families with incomes below poverty level was 1.5 micrograms per deciliter and for children living in families at or above the poverty level is 1.2, a difference that was statistically significant. Therefore, poverty was a risk factor for other age and ethnicities. This slide I like, it shows the possible, the probable source and the effect. It shows the actual lead pipe in the Roman um, Empire with a skeleton that shows lead stored in the bones. I will list some common sources of lead exposure, both industrial and domestic, as we move forward on these slides. Uh, smelters, battery radiators, ship and bridge repair, welders, printers, stained glass, jewelers, plumbers, renovation, renovators, and recyclers. There's radiation shields used in dental offices. Um, Non-residential outdoor paints on cars, highway, bridge, and marine. Batteries, 80% of battery lead is recycled, and this can contaminate the soil and be an occupational exposure for the workers. Domestic, uh, there's two periods uh, when lead paint uh, was decreased in the 1940 and uh, below, and in 1977, paints um, uh, before 1940 had a higher percentage of lead in them. Uh, there's contaminated soil, uh, vinyl mini blinds, there's fuzz medicines, other domestic uh, sources are lead glazed pottery, which we mentioned before, lead crystal, lead weights and sinkers, 
buckshot, projectiles, moonshine, parents' work clothing, curtain and fishing, fishing weights, solder, imported jewelry, makeup, and toys. Stabilizers in the production of plastics, glazes, and crystal. Acidic drinks leach lead into crystal glasses and decanters. And vinyl, vinyl mini blinds deteriorate and lead is released. Uh, solder, do-it-yourself plumbing, uh, food canning, crafting homemade fishing, tackle, and fabricating, fabricating grain alcohol stills and stained glass as a hobby at home or other sources of exposure as well as explosives and ammunition such as lead bullets and buckshot. And this can also be transferred into the meat uh, from hunting. This slide shows um, some toys and jewelry that were found to have lead. Um, there's other sources of, of um, exposure such as imported spices such as turmeric. Uh, the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act uh, was revised and set more strict limits on uh, lead and toys and other items uh, targeted for children. You probably remember a few years ago we had hundreds of recalls uh, for toys such as Thomas the Train, these little charms that were in vending machines and movie theaters, and baby bibs and lunch. We had hundreds of them. I was sending out recall notices to our health districts, it seems like every week. Well, this year, 2013, I had maybe one at the most. So I think a lot of the manufacturers like uh, Mattel uh, and importers are, are doing better quality control because of this regulation. <clears throat> Folk remedies, sources of lead exposure uh, can include uh, uh, Nitarhiho, which is a um, antiperspirant imported from the Dominican Republic, had high levels of lead. Coal, which these two pictures show on the slide. We just had this last month from a child having really high lead levels. The mother was using it on the child's, around the child's eyes. Um, products that contain lead also include azarcon, alarcon, coral, and paleo, and grana. Um, this pro the product is likely a capsule or an orange or yellow powder, which is ingested. Um, coal, which contains the ground galena, which I showed you on the previous slide, is lead in the mineral form. Um, it's a source of lead, and cultures use it in their coal on the umbilical, stamp, umbilical stump of newborns and to decorate the eyes and faces of children. And we've had numerous children lead poisoned from um, these makeups. Still the most common source of lead exposure now is lead paint. Um, dusty, dusting, flaking, and peeling lead paint is the leading cause of source of lead exposure in children. Um, it was used in many paints and it was banned for household use in 1978. It still has commercial use. We see it around um, marinas because it's used in paints. It's still used on your highways to paint uh, lines and sometimes Leftover cans get brought home to, to paint a toy or paint a wagon, so they still um, sometimes get integrated into the, um, into the uh, household market. Homes built before 1978 may contain lead paint. Sources of lead exposure uh, in housing. The age of the house really matters because the older the home, the higher the percent of lead. And also also, the number of houses um, before, but if your house was built before 1940, 87% of those houses probably have lead paint. Between 1940 and 59, about 69% have lead paint. And between 1960 and 78, about 24% have lead paint. So overall, the U.S. housing stock, uh, about 40% have lead paint. And this data is from the National Center for Healthy Housing. Homes built before uh, 1978 may have flaking or peeling paint. Such homes may also contain lead dust, which is impossible to see. Lead dust forms the paint ages and deteriorates, and then smells on the floor and other surfaces all over the house. 
dust also formed from lead paint and surfaces are routinely rubbed and scraped, as in a door or window frame or during home renovation projects. Sandy lead paint, paint and surfaces can produce significant quantities of lead dust. And this really is a prohibited activity in any type of renovation. These next few slides um, were prepared by EPA for consumers. And I, and I think they're a, a very good overview of housing and where you, where you can find the lead. If your house or apartment was built before 1978, chances are it contains lead-based paint. The older the building, the more likely it will contain lead-based paint. Outside, doors, doors. Lead-based paint was often used in these areas. Check the doors and hinges because dust from lead-based paint can be created where painted surfaces rub together when you open and close the doors. Check your windows. As dust and peeling paint from lead-based paint can be created and build up where painted surfaces rub together, like when you open and close your windows. Your fences and porches. Lead-based paint was often used in these areas. Look for chipping or peeling paint that could get into the soil where your children play. Also, lead-based paint was often used on playground equipment and fences that are um, used around garages or old, or old sheds. Uh, when exterior lead-based paint from houses or buildings flakes or peels, it can also get into the soil around your home. Lead dust can be tracked into the home from the soil outside. This can be both by by your shoes, by a pet, especially dogs laying under the porches and coming in the home and the child playing with them. Soil can also be contaminated from lead sources outside the home, including lead and gasoline, industrial sites, and mining activity. Teach your family to wipe their shoes and keep them by the front door. <coughs> Inside, windows. Check the window seals throughout your home. Dust from lead-based paint can be created and accumulated where paint and surfaces rub together like they do outside. But on the inside, the children have more access to those windows when they play with their cars or they look out the window. Uh, vinyl mini blinds, uh, some imported non-glossy vinyl mini blinds um, can be a lead hazard. The sunlight and heat can break down the blinds and may release the lead containment contaminated dust. Um, the mini blinds made before 1997 may contain lead. Most of these were imported and millions were sold. It may still be in many homes, trailers, and modular housing, regardless of the age of the home. <clears throat> water lines and plumbing. Check to see if you have plumbing with lead or lead solder, and if your water utility uses lead service lines. Remember, you cannot see, smell, or taste lead. Boiling your water will not get rid of lead and can actually increase its concentration. Note that most public water sources are routinely tested and do not exceed the EPA limit of 15 parts per billion. However, water may become contaminated if it encounters old lead soldered pipes or lead containing faucets. Lead levels are highest in water that's been left standing in the pipes for more than a few hours and in hot or acidic water. Always run tap water until it feels cold um, to, to your touch before you use it to cook or to drink. <coughs> Diagnosis of lead exposure. At the levels we see today, there usually are no outward symptoms. A blood test is the best way to determine lead exposure. X-rays are indicated if there's a possibility the child ingested an object. Lead stays in the blood after exposure for about 30 to 45 days. This is the half-life of the red blood cell. Children are like sponges and absorb lead very easily. Lead is stored in their soft tissues and bones. Also, lead crosses the undeveloped brain barrier to cause neurological damage. Symptoms in children can include abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, leading to noticeable weight loss, irritable with signs of fatigue, headaches, numbness, tingling, weakness, or pain in the arms and legs. 
as a mother, I can tell you these, these are the same symptoms from a lot of other childhood illnesses, including the flu. So if your child's got any of these symptoms, you really should have them seen by their uh, pediatrician or provider. Effects of lead exposure. Lead interferes with the normal enzyme reactions within the human body. Lead actually mimics the properties of other metals that are essential to biological functioning. However, lead does not work the same way as those metals. The enzymatic reactions that depend on calcium, iron, and zinc are disrupted. The most damaging enzymatic reaction that lead affects is the production of hemoglobin or red blood cell production, which can cause anemia, which is a symptom. And here's a copy <coughs> of a, a picture, a slide of some red cells that have been stained. And with that arrow point, you see the little dots in there. And that's called basophilic stippling. And it shows the, um, uh, the interference in metabolism. Here's some other um, slides showing medical diagnosis. You've got your lead lines at the gum. Um, this is dark deposit of, of lead sulfate on the gum line of patients suffering from lead poisoning. We don't see that too much now, but a lot of countries that do that, that work in the lead industry or mining, you still see that, but it's mostly in adults. Um, the, side, the slide on your right um, was a child presented to the emergency department with colicky abdominal pain. This x-ray was obtained, and the child had numerous paint chips in the area of the rectum. You can see those at the bottom of the, of the uh, slide there. The child's blood blood level was 47 micrograms. Now here's some other diagnostic slides. Um, the x-ray on the left reveals a lead musket ball that was accidentally swallowed by a child and retained in the stomach. Uh, about 24 hours after ingestion, his blood blood level was 84 micrograms. The second x-ray demonstrates a teenager who has retained lead foreign bodies following a shotgun, shotgun blast to the head. Because these foreign bodies were constantly bathed in, in uh, cerebral spinal fluid, the patient had chronically elevated blood blood levels. This was written up in an article published in Pediatrics of 2006. The picture <clears throat> on the right demonstrates a child who swallowed a large leaded sinker, which became retained in the stomach. His lead level is markedly elevated in 24 hours. And you can see this, the uh, size of the, uh, the sinker, which looks like it's about one and a half inches long, and you can see it on the x-ray. And this is where we found cases of children swallowing batteries and, and bullets and things like that, where the lead level <clears throat> do not go down, and the house is not target housing. That's when you really look at look for an X-ray to see if the, if they've got a, something like this has been um, retained in their system. Lead deposited in bone, <clears throat> teeth, and especially in children, the soft tissue. It can be removed from the body by excretion through the kidneys and urine, but this is a very slow process. Lead can also cross the placenta during pregnancy. Even at low lead levels, you get damage to the nervous system, including the brain. Lead interferes with growth. Lead can harm hearing. It may lower your IQ scores and make learning difficult. Lead exposure may also affect a child's behavior and cause attention deficit disorders. Follow-up. <clears throat> chelation therapy may be used at high levels. Studies have found that chelation may assist in temporarily reducing lead in a child to prevent coma. However, the level will rise and stabilize the same level as in children without chelation. This chelation has been shown to have no effect on reducing the long-term effects of the lead exposure. And it should always be performed in a hospital setting. <clears throat> Good nutrition with a diet high in iron, calcium, vitamin C, and low in fat and fast foods reduces the absorption of lead. So even if the child is exposed to some low levels of lead, 
eating the right foods can help prevent the absorption of the lead and the harmful and the harmful effects. Education is a great tool to prevent continued environmental exposure. We want to remove the child from the environment until remediation or abatement is completed with clearance testing. We want to advise the family to wash the child's toys, pacifiers, and hands frequently and remove shoes when entering the house. Uh, encourage wet wiping the window sills and floors frequently and use a HEPA vacuum to clean. No dry sweeping. <clears throat> These are the CDC's new recommended follow-up guidelines for retesting. Uh, with, with blood levels under 10, they recommend confirming that blood test within one to three months. 10 to 44, one week to one month. The higher the screen test, the sooner the confirmatory test shall be performed. At levels 45 to 59, which we don't see that often, within 48 hours. 60 to 69 within 24 hours and greater than equal to 70 immediately as emergency tests. Environmental investigations. Um, we follow pretty much what the EPA recommended when the uh, lead-based paint regulations came out. We do environmental investigations always at greater than or equal to 20 micrograms per Desolator, if it's a confirmed test, and it's in target housing. Um, if the housing is not um, before 1978, we'll still do an environmental investigation, but not a formal risk assessment to look for the toys and the medicines and that type of exposure. Um, if a child has a persistent or rising venous, 15 to 19 will also do a, um, an assessment. The nursing assessments performed to identify other sources of exposures besides housing, note the child's behavior, and determine the age of housing. Then the environmental investigation or risk assessment will be performed on all addresses where the child spends a significant amount of time. Risk assessments are performed only on target housing, which is defined as housing built before 1978, like I mentioned before. If the house is not target housing or is a trailer that environmental investigation performs, which includes water, soil, um, your identified hazards such as old car batteries, vinyl mini blinds, antique toys, spices, home remedies. These, these samples can also be collected during the risk assessment if the nursing assessment shows risk. So bottom line is we do a nursing assessment on levels at, at, uh, even if the housing is not um, target housing so we can look for these other sources of exposure. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Nancy, for your informative presentation. I know that each person on this call learned um, something more about lead exposure and reducing uh, children's lead exposure as well as monitoring for it and sort of conducting that surveillance, that consistent surveillance of lead exposure in children. At this time, we will open up for questions and answers as we wait for um, respondents to begin posting their questions in the box. Um, I would just like to make a few announcements. <clears throat> um, we would, if you are interested in collaborating with the National Center for Health and Public Housing, or presenting information at your agency or health center, I recommend that you submit a call for abstracts to our National Training Symposium, which will be held June 10th through 12th, uh, 2014, in Alexandria, Virginia. And we will also be having a one-day National Training Symposium on aging the day before June 9th. Um, and you can also submit an abstract to that as well. Um, as a reminder, the recording and audio will be made available to everyone on the call, as well as posted to our website in the archived webinar section. You can access that at www.nchph.org. If you are interested in this webinar and the information contained herein, um, please post your questions in the box. We will ask those, and they will also be posted in the recording as well. If you dialed in through your telephone and you would uh, verbally like to ask the presenter a question, please use the raise hand icon 
and your line will be unmuted. So, So for our first question, Nancy, um, do you work with or test any public housing properties in Virginia for lead exposure? Not directly unless we have an elevated blood lead level. We do have <coughs> localities that, that have HUD grants that go in and do a lot of that testing, but we don't, as a, as a public health department, we don't um, test. We have um, funded programs that do, and some of the localities do with their local housing money. Okay, thank you. Um, how can we obtain a? Or this, sorry, this is a, the next question. How can we obtain a list of imported toys that contain lead in it? Okay, you can go to the Consumer Product Safety Commission's website. Uh, the CDC also has a link to that. If you go to their uh, um, Center for Environmental Health and Lead, they've got a link to the toys uh, that uh, have been recalled. Okay, great. And if a child is tested and found to have high levels of lead, what is the next step? Well, the next step is to continue to test that child, but also to look for that source of exposure. If it's a high level, you can do a risk assessment on the home. Um, which is funded by, by most of your um, health departments. If the lead level is low and doesn't qualify, you can still um, have a risk assessment done on your home as target housing, just so you know where um, you've got some sources of exposure. But all of the uh, recommendations on wet cleaning, uh, washing your child's hands and toys, um, checking out which ones may have lead in them, if there's anything recalled. But the most important thing to do is keep your child um, tested and to make sure they've got a really good diet because that can prevent the absorption of lead. Okay. And since you mentioned diet, we have a question here about nutrition as prevention that you mentioned in your, in your um, presentation. How effective is that in very small children who have limited diets? Has that therapy been tested? With a limited diet, is that what you're saying? Um, um, using nutrition as a preventive measure to, um, you know, reduce lead absorption. Yes, it's been um, WIC. We will always refer children to WIC um, if, if they're low income. To make sure they get the, the, uh, the good protein, um, they get the good diet to tie in vitamin C and iron and calcium because the iron and calcium, if you're if you're getting enough of that, there's no place for that lead molecule to bind in the blood. Okay? So having a really good diet can definitely help that child uh, if they are exposed to lead. And the other okay. thing is to make yeah, just make sure you, make sure you can if you can identify sometimes a low lead exposure it's hard to identify the primary source of exposure because there's lead, you know, in the environment, the soil, the air, et cetera. So that's why risk assessments usually don't find a sole source of exposure unless they're at that higher level. Um, mm -hmm. But, but um, when looking for rental housing or uh, purchasing a home, make sure a risk assessment is done prior to, to doing to purchasing. Or if you if it's a rental property, make sure you've got a 1018 lead disclosure, which means that they've done a uh, risk assessment on, on the house at a prior time. You know where the hazards are, so you, you'll be able to have some knowledge to uh, protect your child. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. And which countries are the major exporters of lead-related pro um, products and food? Most, uh, we had, I would say China was where we are, most of the toys that had lead in us were coming from. And that was indirectly from, they were getting a lot of their lead from the United States. We'd, we'd export all of our old computers and a lot of that stuff to, to China. And then they would have the, they would recycle it and make jewelry out of it and send them back to us. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, they, a lot of these countries still use lead and gasoline. And um, they don't have the quality control that we have in the United States on what can be in the products. And as long as we weren't doing it as 
the song as Mattel and all those manufacturers weren't doing quality control, they could use inferior um, alloys and all their toys and get away with it. So, uh, but you also have lead coming from Mexico in your potteries, um, in a lot of your your candy and your and your uh, products from down there. And in Africa, we also had some coffee and chocolates that, that were contaminated with lead because a lot of the grist mills they would use had um, lead in the metal that they're using to grind these um, beans. So some of those were contaminated. Um, so and a lot of your canned goods that are imported, we don't allow lead slaughter in the United States. But just be careful when you um, purchase imported canned goods that um, are <clears throat> that are have acidic tomatoes, et cetera, in them because that can leach the lead from the slaughter, and you can get lead from imported canned goods. Okay. Right. Is lead poisoning a reportable condition? Yes, it is. Um, I'm all, almost all states it's reportable disease. Okay. And how do I test an object for lead and how useful is that test? Okay. The best way is to, is to have a, um, an in-lab laboratory and EPA um, licenses those or certifies those and that list is on the, their website. But as mm -hmm. far as as far as screening your toy, an XRF is good, but you don't have access to that. But you can buy those little um, test kits, lead check kits, like in your uh, local hardware stores. And those are fairly accurate as long as the toy is not red, because if it's red, it's lead. So mm -hmm. um, you can scrape that on the toy and see if it's lead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to be very careful about buying toys at yard, sa at yard sales or flea markets, et cetera. It's illegal to resell a recall toy, but oftentimes um, uh, the person selling the toy does, it has no knowledge that it's been recalled, but you know, the older toys were, didn't fall under the new consumer product safety guidelines and they contain lead. Okay. Thank you. Um, Someone asked, you mentioned lead exposure through pregnancy. Can lead exposure also be through breastfeeding? Um, there, has, there has been some um, talk about that where lead, if, the, if there's lead in the mother's blood, if she's chronically exposed to lead, like if she's doing renovation activities and it's in her blood, or if mm -hmm. she's or she's not getting enough calcium and iron in her diet, those elements will be leached out from her bone marrow, so they could get in her blood. And anything that's in your blood can cross over into the milk, okay? okay. So the best thing is, if you're breastfeeding, you know, make sure you take a, a supplement that's got adequate calcium and iron, and, and you, get, you get the good nutrition. Therefore, you won't leach that from your own bone marrow if you had stores of it there from you being exposed as a child, okay? But don't do renovation or scraping baby furniture or anything like that while you're breastfeeding. All right, the next question is, at infant uh, centers, we sanitize toys. Does every day as children mouth them, does it affect any probable lead in the toy? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, if there's lead in that, if there's lead in the paint on that toy, washing them stuff will remove the lead. Okay, we had a child mm -hmm. that was that poison from 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 licking the uh, the stop sign in Thomas the train set. You know, the little red stop sign. He left left off the red paint until there wasn't any paint there, and it had lead in it. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, washing that every day would not reduce his exposure if there's paint in it. Now, if the, if the toy is free of lead, but your house has lead dust in it, which, you know, from, from, from walking in from the soil outside or your window seals and there's lead dust on that toy, wash it every day will remove that hazard. Excellent. And are there any school-based interventions um, that, de that help detect lead in sickly children or children who are presenting 
I don't think I understand the question exactly. Could you repeat that? Are there any interventions in schools to detect lead in children presenting symptoms of lead poisoning? Uh, no, some, some states have lead testing um, on their physicals for admission to school. But to be honest with you, most of the harmful effects of lead occur between ages of one and three. So by the time they're in school, by the time they're in school, um, they already have the effects of the lead exposure. They're, they're not at risk for lead as much by the time they reach school because they're past that hand of mouth um, uh, behavior, which, which has them ingesting on a daily basis. That said, you know, some children might have a, a, a nickel they got from a machine that's got lead on it. They put it in their mouth and they suck on it, you know, and they can get lead poisoning mm -hmm. that way. Um, but the schools generally don't test for children. I know some head start, I, I know it's a requirement for head stars, and those children do get tested. Okay, thank you. Um, can lead dust lead to any respiratory issues? Lead dust, is, lead, lead itself usually does not cause a respiratory problem, but where there's lead dust, there's probably other asthmatic um, uh, triggers with the lead dust because we found that, that the number of children with lead poisoning, they also have a high incidence of asthma related to, you know, roach dander or other um, dust mites that are in that, that dust, but lead itself doesn't usually cause a respiratory problem, but it's part of the problem where it's found. But just to reiterate, the audio and the presentation will be made available to everyone on the call and posted on our website. If you would like any more information about participating in the upcoming symposiums or submitting an abstract, Please feel free to contact me directly. You also are able to contact any of the staff listed here as well. Um, you can call us. We are available to assist with any form of training and technical assistance that health centers or other agencies may need. Um, we thank everyone for joining us today. And we thank Nancy for her very informative presentation.